Angie. Well, thank you very much, Angie, for that very warm welcome. Uh, and I'd like to welcome all of you to Radio Centre's annual conference, of which the theme, as Angie said, is See Radio Differently. So I guess if we can all, uh, if we can all achieve one thing by the end of the morning, I'd like us to have one different perception about what radio is and what radio can deliver. Um, inevitably, when you come to organising these sorts of events, you look back to what you did this time last year. Uh, and for us, in fact, it was a little less than a year ago. I don't know whether any of you remember, but we were in the ping pong venue bounce uh, down at the end of Hoban. Uh, and at that time, we, we made what we thought, well, we always think we make astute bookings for these conferences, but we made what we thought was a particularly astute political booking in the form of Chris Bryant, the Shadow Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. And of course, he did deliver uh, an excellent speech. Uh, some of his jokes were so good that I've heard Paul Smith from Salador still telling those jokes now, so that sort of seems to me the, the sign of a, a good speech. Uh, but I guess you would have had fairly long odds at that stage if you'd, if, you'd, if you'd speculated that within three short months, Chris Bryant would have been, uh, uh, would have been, shall I say, promoted, or should have been moved to this post of shadow leader of the House, slightly less high profile, and that Jeremy Corbyn would be leader of the Labour Party. Uh, but then again, you would probably would have got about the same odds uh, betting on Leicester City to win the Premier League. So there we go. I think all I'll say is that I won't be making many predictions here today because I think that's a bit of a mugs game, to be honest with you. Uh, so, yeah, we've got a packed agenda today. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that John Whittingdale, the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sports, will be joining us later in the, uh, later in the morning, being interviewed by our chair, Kip Meek. Uh, I'd like to say that too was, was uh, an example of our amazing strategic planning, uh, but of course it is the first time that he will have been on a public platform since the publication of the BBC White Paper um, last Thursday. So that, that's very good timing for us and lots of questions, lots of time to ask him questions about <coughs> um, everything that was in that white paper. Uh, I personally am also looking forward to hearing from Alain de Botton, writer and philosopher, and now I think since Sunday, uh, number one best-selling author. I think he was number one. At, uh, his new novel, Course of Love, is number one uh, in the Sunday Times charts this week. Um, so hoping very much that he will be able to throw a different light on our Seeing Radio Differently theme. Uh, the whole leitmotif of his work tends to be about how you can take a, a different view of things that you, with which you think you're very familiar uh, and in my experience, it's always worth listening to Alain, whatever he has to say. So, uh, so uh, very much looking forward to that. Uh, I guess it's time to do a little bit of a recap, a little bit of a look at where we are in uh, radio at this moment. Well, I mean, we're in a good place, aren't we? We've got a lot of... There's, there's so much happening, it's hard to condense into a few short moments, but I'm going to give it a go. Um, We've had 18 new stations come online just in March this year, thanks to D2. So loads more choice for advertisers and for listeners. That's going to be a good thing. Uh, so I couldn't resist putting that up there. It's not down to me, of course. I'm not claiming credit for the fact that, that radio revs are buoyant at present. But it does cheer us all up that we've overtaken the BBC for the first time in 15 years or indeed the first time this millennium, as some people like to say. But that's maybe a bit of, a, bit, of a, bit of an extravagant quote, but why not? It cheers us all up. Uh, radio revenues are, are going absolutely in the right direction, uh, almost back to pre-recession levels now, which I think is not something that experts would necessarily have predicted when we were back there in the dark days of 2008 and 2009. So it's a sector that's definitely got a lot going on for it at present, uh, and uh, I'm pleased to say that everything's going in the right direction. Uh, and of course, we've had the return of Chris Moyles to, uh, to the radio this, this year, or last year, I should say, in September. Um, acres of newsprint coverage, uh, fantastically huge marketing campaign behind it. And he's definitely making a splash. I think whatever Chris does, it tends, to, it tends to attract some headlines. So we're looking forward to hearing a lot more from Chris this year. 
Uh, and I should also mention, of course, that um, Bauer have just acquired Orion in the West Midlands. So there's lots going on in the sector. This is still lots of innovation uh, and lots of, lots of things to talk about, all of which makes my job a lot easier, I must say. Uh, and one of the joys of my job is that it's about everything. Local radio encompasses so many things, from the very big to the very small. But what, they, what it always does is deliver fantastically for people in their local, in their local towns uh, and communities. So we're looking forward to celebrating Local Radio Day on the 27th of May. Really, it's an opportunity for everybody to just highlight all the amazing things that Local Radio does. So we'll be taking, we'll be taking part in that in quite a big way. Uh, in terms of everything else that's going on, well, a few sort of highlights. Obviously, it's difficult not to talk about the BBC, but uh, I'm most pleased that we're going to have the opportunity to hear from the Secretary of State directly what he actually intends for the BBC, uh, having seen the proposals in the white paper last week. I mean, one of the things about the BBC is people tend to, have very, to, people tend to be very, very passionate about it. Uh, so, so in the run-up to the publication of government proposals on charter renewal, there's always a lot of noise about they're going to do this, they're going to privatise, they're going to... Uh, and then what happens is the government tends to publish proposals that are, are, are nothing like as extravagant as that, and then everybody claims a great victory because they haven't done what they were never going to do in the first place. So that's sort of how the merry-go-round works, but we can hear more from that from John Whittingdale later. Uh, I also think my perception is that it's quite easy to caricature uh, the BBC in the commercial sector being kind of at each other's throats. Obviously, we, we are rivals for audiences, but particularly in radio, I'd say there's so many people who tend to have worked across both sectors uh, that, in fact, it's, we, have, you know, we share our passion for radio, and I think that goes across the whole sector. Uh, so much so, even, that uh, our, some of our best friends work in, uh, in, um, at the BBC. Uh, and I think you'd have to be jolly chummy to let a photograph like that be taken in the first place. That's Ben Cooper, uh, Claire Bowen and myself looking very awkward alongside Ben Cooper. But that's actually was at a fantastic event, uh, very recently uh, chaired by Angie, actually, rather marvellously. Uh, on behalf of Creative Access. Uh, for those of you who don't know that organisation, it's really well worth getting to know it. It's uh, Michael Foster's organisation, which is aimed at getting black and minority ethnic graduates into the creative industries in general. I worked with them a lot when I was at HarperCollins. Uh, I think it's a fantastic organisation, and Ben and I were very happy to co-host that evening with, I mean, amazing talent on stage, as you can see, from the BBC and the commercial sector, uh, and just the most inspiring, amazing group of 200 people who are so enthusiastic that I think I walked away with a great feeling after that evening. So that's just one of the many ways in which we work with the BBC, and it's, it's a really brilliant, brilliant scheme. Uh, Ofcom, of course, is always part of our lives uh, in the commercial radio. They've had a lot of changes there this year, a major change in leadership. Uh, Sharon White, of course, has, has a huge amount on her plate, and even more so now that uh, Ofcom have, uh, have gained the BBC to regulate as well. So we're terribly pleased that in and amongst that, all her busy intray, including the whole telecom sector, the postal sector, the Premier League, that she found time to respond to the government's request to look at the whole regulatory framework governing commercial radio, to, to really take a look at whether that's going to be fit for purpose for the next 10, 20, 30 years even. So Sharon's proposal is now back with government. Um, and DCMS are confidently predicting that we'll have a consultation paper by the summer. Uh, of course, the summer can be a bit of a, an elastic concept in government terms, but I'm still hoping that by the end of the year we will have been able to take part in a really big, really useful consultation process, which gives us a really great regulatory framework for the years ahead. So, uh, and I think we should also stop and thank the government for having responded to our request, which we made this time last year, for such a review to happen. So uh, we're very happy that, to take part in that. I think it's going to be uh, very, very good for the sector in general. 
Uh, and while I'm on the subject of regulation, who would have thought that I was going to spend so much of my life talking about terms and conditions? Uh, but this time last year, uh, you may remember that I talked about starting a lobbying campaign in Brussels and in the UK just to talk about those ridiculous garbled announcements that you have to have at the end of radio adverts for credit ads that are so particularly intrusive in, in an audio environment. Um, I, well, it won't surprise you to know that we've gathered quite a lot of support for it. It's very difficult to actually find anyone who will defend that as a piece of good consumer communication. Even the people who made the regulation in the, in the commission tend to sort of squirm a bit when you play them one of the worst examples of those advertisements. So the UK government have been very supportive. Uh, we've got a lot of MEPs on side. We've got consumers associations, uh, the campaign for plain English, uh, uh, the retail motor industries, uh, you know, a whole coalition of people who think, and by the way, we absolutely support the aim of this regulation. Of course, we want consumers to be protected. We want our listeners to be protected. Why wouldn't we? Um, uh, and obviously, there's a financial incentive for us as well. But actually, what we're, what we're saying to regulators is allow us to help you to come up with something that actually makes sense as a piece of, uh, of consumer communication, but actually also communicates the messages at the right time when people need to hear it and allows advertisers to use the medium of radio uh, in, in a way that, that we think they, they would benefit from, as would consumers. Um, so I have recently been on, on BBC Radio 4's uh, Moneybox programme, confidently predicting that all of these uh, T's and C's would be reformed in a year's time. So uh, the clock's ticking for me then on that one. And I did say it out loud, and I did say it on the BBC. Um, I suppose a few people have said about this, isn't it a slightly odd time to be lobbying in Europe, bearing in mind that there's clearly something much bigger coming around the corner uh, in the shape of uh, a European referendum uh, on in or out for the UK on the 23rd of June. Um, and my answer to that is, whatever happens after the 23rd of June, we will still have regulators to talk to. Uh, and, you know, we've been talking to regulators in Brussels, we've been talking to, to the government and the regulatory authorities here, so, you know, we carry on. We've laid the groundwork. Um, that's what I would say to that. So, uh, uh, for me, very buoyant sector still. 90% of the population is still listening to radio for all the reasons that we know about. It's got fantastic reach. It's immediate uh, and it can be very creative, very, very good for brand building. Uh, and yet, for us, there's, there, there is an element I in which advertisers are kind of reluctant to use radio to the extent which we think they probably could. So, with all those very clever people in Lucky Generals who are sitting in the audience today, uh, we, we are today launching an advertising campaign which is aimed at kind of teasing out some of those arguments a little more. Some of you might have heard it on the radio this morning, but I've got a feeling you'll be hearing it later when Andy gets on stage. But that, of course, is all coming up soon, as those uh, incredibly irritating television presenters always say. Um, what I would say, so we've got a lot to get through this morning. Uh, we have recorded industry leaders kind of talking about what keeps them awake at night uh, in a good way and a bad way the challenges they face and the opportunities. Uh, so the first film you're going to see is, uh, the question was, what are the main changes in the radio industry? How has that affected you, your business, and the industry at large? So um, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> 